Uh, this is Abe Dachman. I'll be speaking about diffuse and focal diseases of the spleen. I'm going to emphasize rad path correlation and the importance of clinical correlation to limit the differential diagnostic possibilities of uh, entities seen in the spleen. Most of the cases are taken from the AFIP or University of Chicago, and some others acknowledged on the slide. I think most people feel a little bit uncomfortable with diagnoses in the spleen, and that's why I thought this lecture was uh, worthwhile. Um, the point being that if you know the clinical and you correlate it with the clinical, you usually can whittle the differential down to two or three things. I'm going to start with some challenge cases. The answers will be incorporated into the lecture. Uh, one, history withheld giving you four possibilities, subcapsular hematoma, pancreatitis, treated lymphoma, or metastatic ovarian implant. Challenge case number two, scans one week apart. On the left is the first scan. The patient was asymptomatic. It was an incidental finding. And the scan on the right, about a week later, the patient presented with acute left upper quadrant pain, giving you three possibilities, lymphoma, hemangioma, and abscess. Challenge case number three is a patient who is asymptomatic, no known primary malignancy. One cut showing some lesions in the liver and spleen. Differential, treated meds, lymphoma, sarcoid, or cantidine. Since the outline of some of the entities I will cover, leaving out trauma, and uh, the examples are, don't include every single entity in the spleen due to the uh, time limitations. First, I want to just give you a little bit about exam choices. If somebody presents with acute left upper quadrant pain, worried about vascular entities, rupture, and things like that, you should have a full CT angiogram with pre-arterial and venous phases. You don't need to bother to give oral. Time is of the essence. A nonspecific pain or FUO, fever of unknown origin, you should just be doing a routine CT with oral and IV in a portal venous phase. If somebody has an incidental splenic lesion detected, then it really depends. If they do have a known underlying disease, usually CT in the portal venous phase would be sufficient. If they have a known malignancy, then depending on the scenario, obviously you could consider other things such as FDG PET or assessing stability with CT or MR. The question is, is the lesion solid versus cystic or some unusual cases like splenic torsion? Ultrasound is very good. Most incidental lesions are benign, and spleen size alone can easily be judged on an ultrasound. I won't read every word of the slides to you, but I just wanted to show you a little bit about the splenic anatomy in terms of microscopy to make the point that there's splenic red pulp and white pulp, and uh, there are sinusoidal spaces, and it's the differential flow in the sinusoidal spaces in the red and the white pulp that give the moiré pattern that we'll show in a moment on the arterial phase of any scan, whether it's a CT or an MR, and the contrast in hand scan. So here on the upper left, you can see this so-called cord-like serpentine pattern, the moiré pattern, and that's due to the differential flow between the red and the white pulp. It can be exaggerated in patients with splenic vein compression or occlusion. And uh, it disappears on the venous phase. So whether you're dealing with a CT or an MR, I just used MRs, for example, uh, it should become homogeneous. Spleen can have also little clefts, uh, which usually confuse people if they haven't paid attention to it when they read out CTs and then get a trauma case. Uh, you might think it's a laceration, but there's no subcapsular or perisplenic blood. And just uh, get used to looking at these and try to look for them. You'll see them quite commonly. And the spleen can also have various locations for its hilum, medial, anterior, posterior. It can also have something that looks like a little accessory spleen, but it doesn't have its own blood supply. It's attached to the spleen. That's called a splenic bud. Here seen in the arterial phase where you have also the moiré pattern. As opposed to accessory spleens that have their own little blood supply. Here seen on ultrasound CT and MR. You can also have a little accessory spleens embedded in the tail of the pancreas. So it's very, very much key and interesting to have multiple phases because as long as the texture of the lesion is the same as the main body of the spleen, that's the clue that you're dealing with an accessory spleen as opposed to the tail of the pancreas, for example. 
here's a patient who's had a splenectomy, so what is that and left up a quadrant behind the stomach? Well, that's an accessory spleen that hypertrophied. So it may have been small and not noticed uh, during the surgery, but these small accessory spleens can uh, hypertrophy. Here we are in the left upper quadrant, and we don't see any spleen. Uh, you go down a little further, and there is the spleen in the pelvis. So this is an example of a normal variant of a long pedicle to the spleen. Uh, and the spleen then is free to move or wander. A complication of wandering spleen, because it can move around as it can twist, so wandering spleen can be complicated by splenic torsion. Here's a wandering spleen in an old nuclear medicine study. You can see the spleen is coming down into the pelvis, but it also has a space-occupying lesion with a rim sign around it, which is a congenital splenic cyst, sort of two congenital abnormalities. And uh, we'll just cover one, congenital, and then one additional congenital condition, polysplenia. Often has bilateral left sideness, bilateral left lungs, various vascular abnormalities, IBC with infrapatic interruption, AST, VSD. And here you can see on MR and on ultrasound, multiple lesions that have the same texture that you would expect for the spleen. And multiple splenules or spleens. Uh, here we see multiple and um, numerous calcifications in the spleen. It can be few or multiple. And the most common thing to do that would be granulomas. Depending on where you live, TB, histoplasmosis, or brucella can do that. But not every calcification in the spleen is granuloma. Patients with cirrhosis can have little foci of hemosiderin, hemorrhage, and hemosiderin deposition called gamma-gandy bodies. They look just like granulomas. With a little high-density uh, high, uh, foci on CT, echogenic, maybe a little shadowing on ultrasound. Here's a patient with a bizarre... Heavy calcification pattern in the spleen, but also some calcifications in the left kidney and nodes. And the patient had a history of infection involving the spleen with pneumocystis carini. And infarcts. So infarcts are one of the common things that we may see as incidental findings on CT in asymptomatic individuals, but they can also present acutely. Experimental data has shown that most infarcts actually around or irregular and most of them heal and disappear the minority will remain you can make a diagnosis of infarct or suggest it when the lesion has a straight line sign or has a wedge-shaped configuration uh, regardless of whether it's ct mr ultrasound with a wedge pointing towards the hilus of the spleen on the other hand if you do have acute left upper quadrant symptoms particularly if you see bulging of the contour not shown in these cases or vascular flow phenomena within it on colored Doppler, that would be an acute infarct, and those do have a propensity to rupture. So you want to follow those. Some other patterns of infarct in the spleen, a more geographic pattern in the left, peripheral geographic pattern, and then another one with mixed irregular and somewhat wedge-shaped areas in a patient with erythral leukemia. So patients with infiltrative disorders of the spleen sometimes develop little infarcts within that are not part of the underlying disease, but a sequela or a complication of the underlying disease. Another pattern seen in sicklers with veno occlusive disease is this geographic pattern. Notice it, the cords of hypodensity are not thin like uh, in the moiré normal pattern in the arterial phase. These are not arterial phase scans, they're venous phase scans. And the areas of hypoattenuation are larger and more irregular in shape. These are infarcts. Another pattern seen in patients with sickle crisis or peripheral hair on end kind of appearance in the periphery of the spleen, you can see in this patient. And those may go on to develop a complete autoinfarction, small spleens that could be sufficiently calcified to see in plain film outlined by the arrows or here on CT. Sometimes your eye goes by it thinking it's just a little rib, not realizing it's a calcified spleen. Sometimes the spleen can be calcified but still maintain its normal size. Uh, or the entire splenic parenchyma may not calcify like the one on the left, the one on the right with a little island of sparing, which uh, in my unofficial research uh, did not correspond to fetal hemoglobin levels. Thought it might, but it did not. Splenic artery aneurysm is the most common visceral aneurysm. They're usually distal near the splenic hilus. 
they are more likely to rupture in patients with portal hypertension, pregnancy, or liver transplants. Um, if they are pseudoaneurysm secondary to the pancreatitis, they have a very high incidence of rupture, sometimes into unusual locations. And here we have aneurysmal dilatation of literally the entire length of the splenic artery, giving this unusual pattern. And sometimes they can thrombose, and then you might wonder if they're tumors, but to be careful not to biopsy a peripherally calcified presumptive tumor uh, unless you're really sure that it's not a thrombosed splenic artery aneurysm. Here's a splenic, uh, here's a splenic artery aneurysm, but with multiple hypodense lesions in the spleen in a patient with fever. Uh, they might, for example, have aortic or mitral valves, and these, and this patient has an infected, those are splenic abscesses, and that is an infected or mycotic aneurysm. Those are usually treated with resection rather than um, simply giving IV antibiotics. Other predisposing causes would be vascular trauma and IV drug abuse. So the appearance of splenic abscesses really depends on uh, the scenario. So well, first of all, most patients are immunosuppressed, sometimes diabetics, they usually have fever, white count, and left upper quadrant pain. But the abscesses can be solitary, multiple, or multilocular, and most to do the hematogenous seeding, less commonly do the direct extension or superinfection of an organizing hematoma or healing infarct. Complications would include sepsis, rupture, and fistula. So now we've seen uh, Another entity that can rupture infarcts and splenic abscesses uncommonly, or are the list of things that can rupture. Uh, look for underlying immunocompromise, and the imaging will reflect the no size, number, and maturity of the abscesses. They can be hypodense without enhancement, hypoechoic on ultrasound. Sometimes they are anechoic and fluid density. Sometimes they have debris within, um, and sometimes there is peripheral wall enhancement. Here's an example of candidal abscesses on a cut growth specimen, multiple small uniform white collections. Uh, and this is from the test cases, the challenge cases. It's unusual to have splenic abscesses without liver. Uh, the one on the left, is, has, this patient has both splenic and liver lesions, with the so-called microabscess pattern, where all the lesions are very small. And here on ultrasound, with some of the lesions have little central dots in the middle, called the target sign, a wheel within a wheel pattern, if it has another rim around it. And the natural history of candidal abscesses has been studied in some of the older literature. It can go from being a simple hypoechoic, hypodense lesion to developing a target due to a rim of inflammation around it and fibrosis, and sometimes the dot in the middle being the candidal proliferation. So they can heal completely and disappear, but sometimes they heal and don't disappear, so they may remain for life, even though the patient has no active infection. An example of splenic abscess is on the left, and the arterial phase on the right, and probably leaked from the splenic artery into the abscess, and we're getting gross enhancement within the splenic abscess. And here, again, a microabscess pattern in a normal-sized spleen, but the patient has known Crohn's, known pulmonary TB, and so this is spread from pulmonary TB to the spleen with multiple splenic microabscesses in this so-called small miliary pattern. And one of the most common things we see incidentally on cross-sectional imaging of splenic cysts, you can read some of the data here, basically there are two types, the congenital and the post-traumatic. It's thought that most of them are post-traumatic in endemic areas, hydatid with peripheral daughter cysts have a unique appearance, might be considered. But again, even if a cyst is congenital, it can be big, it could be small, the patient could be traumatized in the left upper quadrant, and if it's a congenital cyst can then develop hemorrhage within it. So you can't really, really tell whether a cyst is congenital or acquired from looking at it, even in the cut gross. But if you take enough specimens from the wall and look at it microscopically, the congenital ones have this epithelial layers, and the, the false cyst or post-traumatic ones have this nonspecific mesothelial layer. Again, on the ultrasound or CT or MR, it depends on its maturity. You can have a from anything from a small cyst, like you see over here, with no blood flow within it, to something with a complex hematoma within it and even developing calcification. So here on the one on the left, you can see rim-like calcification and septate that are calcified even on a plain film. 
and a big splenic assist enlarging the spleen and exerting mass effect on the aorta and left kidney just to remind us that even though the spleen is an intraperitoneal organ it has normally a short pedicle and therefore exerts marked mass effect when it's enlarged on retroperitoneal structures and these old cases are what I call the missing link. We see so much splenic trauma, but how, when have you had a chance to see a splenic hematoma evolve into a splenic cyst, since we think that most splenic cysts are post-traumatic? This is so-called missing link, where you have solid and cystic components, some areas with hemorrhage or high density centrally, and calcifications along the rim, uh, and other areas that are calcified. So basically a post-traumatic case evolving into a splenic cyst. Uh, Next is the most common incidental tumor, would be a splenic hemangioma. Pablo Ross, uh, at, when we wrote these up at AFIP, described cystic and spongy types, which you can see over here in these endothelial lines, spaces filled with blood. And the appearance depends on whether you have a solid or cystic type, the cystic type being more uniform, the spongy type being more heterogeneous with solid and cystic components. But as opposed to hepatic hemangioma, splenic hemangioma often lacks the classic peripheral nodular enhancement that we see in hepatic hemangiomas. Uh, so here's a case on the left that does have the classic pattern, but it's in the minority where you have hypervascular foci, well demarcated round that become nearly isodense in the delayed phase. The uh, one on the upper right to show that these could be complex, solid and cystic components, and on the right, rarely have foci of calcification. Pre-arterial venous and delayed phases, showing lesion more conspicuous on the uh, arterial and portal venous phase, while demarcated. Some central enhancement and disappears, but no peripheral nodular enhancement that you'd expect to see in the hemangioma in the liver, for example. Well demarcated echogenic focus in the upper left, well demarcated, less echogenic focus with increased through transmission on the right, and a little focus of calcification in the lower left. One in the lower right, but a complex lesion with those solid and cystic components. A multifocal lesions within the spleen on the top, and patient with Kippel Trinani Weber syndrome. And on the right, multiple hypodense lesions that stand out best in the TT2 portal venous phase. Hyperintense, well demarcated lesions. This was from the test cases. Let's just stop and think about this. So the one on the left, 72 year old man, if I recall, um, asymptomatic incidental finding. The CT was done for unrelated reason. And you see two lesions in the spleen, one large, bulging the contour of the spleen, a little focus of calcification, and a second lesion. So if you ask yourself what's going to be multiple in a patient who has no known primary, no lymphoma. So Mets lymphoma are unlikely. He doesn't have a fever or white count. Infection's not likely. Focus of calcification makes infection or untreated lymphoma unlikely. So mangioma is the most likely thing. And the patient came back a week later with spontaneous rupture of the mangioma, big hematoma, and subcapsular fluid. Uncommon entity, sclerosing angiomatoid nodular transformation, often has this characteristic appearance with a spoke wheel pattern due to its fibrotic bands with um, progressive enhancement from the periphery to the center, progressing from the arterial to the portal venous phase here on this MRI. Another case, just showing a little different pattern, doesn't always have the spoke wheel pattern, so it could be more heterogeneous uh, and non less specific in some patients. A much less common lesion, hematoma, is often a solitary lesion, solid, slightly heterogeneous, not cystic. Uh, you could see lymphangiomas are also uncommon. Grossly, on a cut gross, I can't tell them apart from hemangiomas, but just on microscopy, they're not filled with blood, they're filled with these nonspecific eosinophilic staining material. It can be solitary, a part of a lymphangiomatosis involving multiple organ systems. Uh, can present in childhood, rarely calcified, rarely solid versions. So I've noticed that many of them bulge the contour of the spleen in our subcapsular in location. That might be a clue. Clue multiplicity in subcapsular location of near fluid density lesions. Think about lymphangioma. It's just a couple of other proven, again, path proven example from the FIP where it was cystic and one with calcification. <laughs>
and one that was uh, solid. Lymphoma. Now, lymphoma in the spleen is a primary disease. Primary splenic lymphoma is extremely rare. That would be defined as lymphoma involving only the spleen and the node at the hilus. But most lymphoma in the spleen is part of generalized disease. And it can have a variety of patterns, nonspecific splenomegaly or an infiltrative pattern, small miliary masses that look like the microabscess pattern, or multiple large varying size masses, or a single large solitary mass, or a single large necrotic mass. So the imaging will similarly vary, usually hypodense, usually does not enhance the big lesions show necrosis. And again, you'd expect to see adenopathy elsewhere, either clinically or on imaging. True Solitary splenic lymphoma is quite rare. Similarly, on ultrasound, usually a solitary or small, multiple hypoechoic lesions. Uh, nukes, they would be usually hot on PET. Um, and again, depending on the situation, you may or may not need to go that far to get a PET. So here's multiple varying size masses on a cut growth specimen and a CT where the overall spleen size is just sort of up and normal. Here, a normal size spleen, the two different patients, the one on the left with a miliary pattern, and the one on the right with a single lesion, but with little necrosis you know, off-center. Here, one in the portal venous phase that looks like it's absolutely fluid density with no solid component, but on the delayed phase, you see some mural solid nodular component, so that's a clue that you're not dealing with something like a simple cyst or an infarct. Uh, you think about lymphoma or a met and hypoechoic, but not cystic, really. There is a little increase through transmission, probably because of some cystic component within the necrosis within. Uh, CT and ultrasound from the same old case, but with multiple lesions in the spleen and also growing to involve the hyalus of the spleen and encasing the stomach. A large lesion with irregular central necrosis on ultrasound, and then a delayed old CT showing how big and necrotic these tumors can get. Uh, less commonly, an unusual hypervascular pattern of splenic lymphoma that can mimic hemangioma or peliosis, which is an entity we did not have time to discuss, which are multiple small little cystic spaces, it can occur in the liver, can occur in the spleen. So here you have very well demarcated hypervascular lesions that look very similar to hemangioma. Uh, some unusual complications of splenic lymphoma, this one necrosing and rupturing into the stomach, so the oral contrast from the stomach has now gotten into the necrotic splenic lymphoma. This is the same case showing a bleeding in the stomach on the late phase from an angiogram. Two different patients, the one on the right, late phase from an angiogram showing varices, but what's missing is the splenic vein, so splenic vein thrombosis complicating splenic lymphoma. And then on, one on the right, a necrotic splenic lymphoma with gas within, and that turned out to have a bacterial uh, uh, and or candidal superinfection. Now, these two patients, the one on the left was one of the challenge cases, have the same disease, maybe a little different phases. They both have elevated lipase. They both had pancreatitis. Um, so pancreatic pseudocysts can dissect into all sorts of unusual locations. So the one on the left is subcapsular, which is why it's mimicking a subcapsular hematoma, which is what... Uh, you might have thought in the challenge case, uh, whereas this one has a thick rim, so it's dissecting into the splenic pulp, and it's a true intrapancreatic, intrasplenic uh, pancreatic pseudocyst. METs, usually hematogenous, but alternately can be implants on the surface of the spleen in patients with intraperitoneal disease. Hematogenous uh, spread usually would involve the liver so it would be unusual to see spleen without liver involvement. The common primaries that can involve spleen, melanoma lung, breast, colon, stomach, prostate, and ovary, and the gynae tumors via peritoneal spread. So here's a gynae tumor implanting on the surface of the spleen, going through the crap all this bleeding within the mat, layering effect. And uh, some of the implants can push far into the spleen, almost look like hematogenous spread, but these are all peritoneal implants from melanoma in this patient. And the last thing that can mimic the microabscess pattern, now we've seen several things that can do that, is sarcoid. Sarcoid can also have multiple small lesions in the spleen, best seen with contrast enhancement. Here on the arterial and the venous phase, hard to see on the delayed and on the pre. And again, these patients have known sarcoid or pulmonary sarcoid when you investigate them.
So the take-home points are really the value of clinical correlation. You know, if you have fever, you're going to be thinking about abscess and maybe a necrotic tumor. If you have weight loss or a known primer, you're thinking about metastatic disease. Adenopathy, in addition to METs, think about lymphoma and trauma, which we didn't cover, hematoma. Travel history, immunocompromised patients, think about infection. We talked about cal- calcifications and granulomatous disease, gamma-gandhi bodies in patients with portal hypertension, and several tumors or infections that can calcify, as well as sickle. Uh, incidental focal lesion on a high-dense lesion on a CT is probably the most common everyday scenario that you'll apply this lecture. Things like uh, hemangioma, cyst, maybe an infarct, much less commonly a met or a primary. Again, with the METs, you'll have a known primary uh, most of the time, and a, a malignancy involving the spleen is very, very rare as a primary. Known diseases, I give you some examples, sickler, pancreatitis, gachets are usually children, and the massive splenomegaly, and you know it, but they can also have little small hypodensities that look like microabscesses within the massively enlarged spleen. We talked about spontaneous rupture being very rare, non-traumatic rupture, but of the things that might do that are hemangioma, infarct, and abscess, and we talked about following those patients if they have acute left upper quadrant pain to make sure they're not developing some subcapsular fluid or vascular flow phenomena in an infarct on collodoppler imaging, in which case you want to be alert to the possibility of rupture. The other point, if it's a cyst, rule out abscess, cystic tumor, pseudocyst, or a central aneurysm. Again, to summarize some of the microabscess pattern causes candida, mycobacterium avium, intracellularia, pneumocystis, bartonella, peliosis, sarcoid, and Gaucher's patients. In general, CT is best. Use a CTA for acute symptoms or hypotension. Ultrasound, if you need to see solid versus cystic internal architecture, sometimes patients with a known malignancy. Is this an incidental loma or a MET uh, or involvement by tumor? A PET scan could be helpful. We've de- talked about following infarcts, even they're acute. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this helps you in your everyday practice.